Welcome to Major Keys. I'm here with Coach Nikki Collin, the head coach of the Atlanta Dream. Coach, thank you so much for joining me today. Excited to be here. Yeah, thank you for taking the time. I've been an Atlanta Dream fan uh, since the beginning, 2008. I can remember being in high school, being a, a local basketball player here, and coming to, I think we came to probably half of the games that year, uh, my sister and I. So um, thank you. This is an honor. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so I want to start off, where did sports start for you? I read an article that... You wanted to be the next Chris Everett. Yeah. But obviously the journey changed somewhere in there. So Absolutely. I, I think that, you know, I grew up with um – sports in general. You know, my dad was a Michigan football fan. And so I can remember Saturdays watching Michigan football and, and from a young age, I mean, I, I don't, you can't point to that moment where sports were important. It just felt like they were always around me. So, you know, I was, um, you know, really not in the gym much as a young player. Cause I was more on the soccer field, on the baseball field, started playing little league baseball when I was five. And, and uh, played boys baseball all the way through the eighth grade. And um, so, but yeah, kind of fell in love with, with tennis when I was, uh, we, when we moved to Indiana and we were in kind of a, next to a tennis club uh, community and I had the opportunity to start to take lessons. I just felt like that's what I was going to be. You know, I, I, I've joked before that I wasn't sure anything other than I knew somehow I was going to be famous. So it started out with like, I was going to be the next Chris Everett, you know, but, but yeah, just sports were always, you know, football season, my dad and I, he'd get home from work. We, we, I'd run routes in the backyard, uh, basketball season. Then when I got into basketball, it was very much tied to that. Then it was fly balls. And, uh, in the spring when I would play softball and baseball. So, you know, sports were always a part of my day. And, you are obviously a very decorated um, collegiate athlete. What things did you learn over your time, um, those four years being a college player? Well, I think, um, you know, being also in, in engineering from the start, you know, I had to learn time management from the minute I stepped foot on campus. You know, I, I joke that my freshman year at Purdue, which is, is very much a um, well-known engineering school, and freshman year is about weeding out people that really aren't cut out for it. Um, you know, my day might start with weights or some kind of basketball thing in the morning. I'd go to class, I'd go to practice, um, then I'd go back to class, then I would go to basically study hall and sometimes like not be able to make it up three flights of stairs um, at my dorm at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, the beauty of, to me, college athletics, as much as they tell you that it's about learning time management, you really have no choice. Like, you don't, if there's one good thing about it, you don't say, oh, I'm going to go hang out here because I have time to study. You study because it's the only time you have. And so, but I think it teaches you discipline and it teaches you, um, you know, to really prioritize in, in terms of, what do I want out of this college experience? And it wasn't like I didn't have a social life or have great friends, but I certainly prioritized basketball and academics. And so I think it, it kind of gave me a good um, launch point, you know, to, to moving forward in my career. Moving forward in your career, there's obviously been time since your playing days have been over. So how do you get from there to now being the head coach? Yeah, the you know, um, a lot of meandering roads, I guess, in some ways. You know, my dream was to play. I still say that as much as I love to coach, if I could still be playing, I would always play before coaching. Um, you know, I didn't think I'd get into coaching. I genuinely did not believe this was where my, my career was going to go. Um, I was always intrigued by broadcasting, but... Um, when I got my degree in engineering, I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll be an engineer. And, uh, you know, but I tried the playing route. I went overseas, enjoyed it. Uh, but when the ABL folded and suddenly all the ABL players were flooding into a league with only eight teams, I knew that, you know, my pro career in the United States was going to be going to be really hard to come by. And so I had to make, you know, that, that fork in the road. What do I do now? And I applied for a few coaching jobs. I applied for a lot of engineering jobs and took an engineering job thinking I should really try this. You know, this is what I got my degree in. And, uh, but before I started, I got an opportunity to coach ultimately, um, for someone that ended up being my husband. And, you know, I just knew that basketball wasn't out of my system, um, because it was so easy to be pulled back into a career that was going to pay me, um, at the time a third as much, um, but you know, it just, it was kind of where my heart was. So, you know, I really just followed his career 
you know, for almost 20 years, it felt like, you know, we, we went from one job to another for him. And sometimes I coached and sometimes I didn't. Uh, I think I was always growing in my knowledge of the game and in my confidence in the game, but it took kind of his retirement and me jumping off and kind of, uh, for the first time making decisions about my career and what was best for me personally, that kind of got me here pretty quickly to a head coaching position. Right. So that happens. You get here, you're at the Atlanta Dream. You're the head coach. It's your first head coaching gig. Yeah. What's going through your head? Um, you know, I'm not sure. I, I uh, When I got the job off, first of all, I was surprised to get the job offer. I think I started the process thinking this will be good for me because it'll be good experience to interview and be in these type situations. This league traditionally recycles a lot of coaches. You've seen a lot of different coaches at a lot of different spots and good or bad, it just is what it is, you know, and so, you know, but I thought it would be a good experience. And, and when things aligned and I got the job offer while I was in my interview, um, you know, it was one of those situations where super rewarding, but super humbling at the same time, uh, but still took me a little bit of time to like pull the trigger and say, yeah, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do. You know, you want, um, I've always believed that, you know, God lays out a path for you and, and puts you in situations, but, you know, making the right decision in that moment is still very much free choice. And, um, you know, and, but I thought I was ready. And I think the moment I took the job, I think I knew I was ready because I just started, you know, making lists and it was, here's what I have to get done today. And here's what I need to get done tomorrow. And here's what I need to get done. You know, over the next month, I've got to get a staff hired, you know, free agency is going to start. And when you just kind of start putting one foot in front of the other and start working, you realize, okay, I know what I'm doing here. Not that you don't have all those questions about, how is this team going to perceive me? You know, are they going to believe in me and what I'm the message I'm portraying, you know, but I think, you know, the, the work part was the normal part. It's what I knew. So you spoke about your husband and I was reading an article. Um, and he said, they saw me all those years. They saw me as the breadwinner and the dad, which is the typical description of a lot of families. So I think it gives our children a chance to see her through a completely different lens. They always knew that they loved her and that she was a good mother but now they're seeing her as this successful coach, as this businesswoman, as this leader and mentor. Mm -hmm. How important is that reality for your family? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's important, um, starting with me, you know, because I think, um, I wanted this, you know, I wanted this opportunity. I, I think, you know, when you're in a relationship, somebody's always going to be sacrificing. And, and I think that, um, for years, you know, I put our family first, I put Tom's career first and it was the right thing to do. Um, and I think on the flip side, you know, him allowing me to kind of spread my wings and be able to do this, um, is, a, is important for our relationship, but it's important because my kids now know that, you know, regardless of what they go into, um, that there's a route to get there if you work hard. And, um, I want my son to see me as a strong female. I want that role model for him as much as being a stay at home mom was really important and nurturing. And, um, and at the same time, you know, I have, I have girls that have different interests and probably won't get into coaching one day. Um, but seeing me, you know, I, I think that, there was a great joy this year post game and seeing, um, them be in our locker room and be around our players and being proud of their mom and, um, you know, having their teachers know who I am and, you know, wanting me to be at career day and things like that. Those are all like little things that I think impact them and hopefully impact them in a way that, you know, they continue to not expect things to come their way, but knowing that if they work hard enough, the opportunities are there for them to be successful. You talk about being a a role model for young girls. The WNBA just signed a partnership with CBS Sports Network to televise 40 games Mm -hmm. during primetime and weekends. What does that mean for the league? Well, I think um, any visibility we get, especially national visibility, is important. Um, You know, we've always been in local markets. There's always been the access um, really inexpensively to to the app. But I think being on national TV... Um, gives, gives us more exposure. You know, for us personally, we only had one ESPN game this year. So to have an additional seven games on CBS Sports, 
um, and, and to be seen nationally is really important. It's important for our players' marketability. It's important, you know, just for the growth of this league as we try to, um, you know, we've been around 23 years. Um, the longest existing women's professional league. So we've done some things right, but it doesn't mean we don't know that we still have room to grow, that we need to grow our fan base, that we need to reach more fans and, and more demographics. So hopefully this is just one way we can get there. Why do you think it's specifically important for young women to see those, for those players to be prominent figures in well, I think we don't we don't understand what we don't see. You know, I mean, I, I don't want to compare it to Obama, but I, I certainly think that, you know, I saw this shift uh, when Obama became president um, in terms of African American men and women thinking, okay, that's possible for me now. So if we don't see it happen, we don't know that it, it can exist. You know, we talk about this all the time, you know, that we have um, not enough women in coaching and, you know, we have men in women's coaching and, and we should have more women in men's coaching. But for years and years and years, um, they're just there wasn't that person to look to. I mean, Rick Pitino did hire, you know, Bernadette Maddox, and, and she did work for him at Kentucky um, and then proceeded actually to work in the WNBA for a little while. But, you know, we haven't seen it in the mainstream. We haven't seen it on TV until Becky Hammond, you know, and now doors are opening for WNBA players to get involved in the NBA. And so hopefully we start to see, because someone's done it, I mean, before long, Becky Hammond will be a head coach in the NBA. And, you know, we'll all be championing her because if she's successful, that makes it so much easier for the next female, you know, to do the same thing. Um, you know, to, if she struggles and doesn't do well, we know what that means too, right? It's harder for the next female to be successful. So, you know, I, I think it just becomes that, being a role model players, um, our players being seen, young girls seeing them, they know that WNBA exists. Um, you know, hopefully it just continues to grow our game. Yeah, and the WNBA has been around for, as you said, 23 years. What things have you been excited about, the strides that we've made in our game, as well as what are you excited about in the future? Well, I think the product is good. You know, I think the product is as good as it's ever been in terms of the depth of our league, the talent of our league, the versatility of our league and players. Um, it's just really hard to make our league today. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a fun year. I think it's going to be a unique year. When you think about some of the key players that you won't see out on the court this year, you can be disappointed and say, hey, some fan favorites aren't playing this year. Maya Moore's not playing this year. Brianna Stewart's injured and isn't playing. Um, you know, when is Angel McCautry going to get back? I mean, is Skylar Diggins going to come back from maternity leave? Like, we have all these question marks, right, about key players. But what it does is it allows other players to step up and for us to, you know, kind of build some new names in this league. And that's never going to hurt because those players are going to come back. You combine that with, you know, some younger or some new players that people start really paying attention to. And I think that's exciting for the league. Um, I mean, I, I still think we've got to grow our fan base. You know, I don't think there's any doubt that, you know, we need um, businesses to buy into what we're doing. We need partnerships and sponsorships, and we need those patches on our uniform. And we need, um, because, you know, when, when companies invest money in us, and then get return on it, that just drives the next person to us. And so, you know, I think as much as anything, that's where we have to be better, you know, where we have to see growth in our partnerships, sponsorships, um, so that our players are marketable and people think it's okay to support, you know, a league of women. So you've had a lot of success, tremendous amount of success. You were the WNBA Coach of the Year last year in your rookie season, which unheard of, <laughs> and you've coached at five different Division One programs, so again, lots of success. What is one major key of advice you would give to girls who would want to be successful in following your footsteps? I mean, it, it sounds simple, but it's it's you know I think I've always believed that you know when you you kind of find your purpose and you you attack it with passion. Um, it's silly to say anything is possible, right? I mean, it's so easy that we we can tell our kids whatever you want to do, you can do. I'm not sure that's realistic, but I think when you can realistically look at the world and and also be super passionate about what you're doing, um, I believe my greatest strength is that 
I, I just don't want to get outworked, you know? And so, you know, as once again, it comes down to how, how hard are you willing to work? Are you willing to put in the time? Are you going to outwork the person, um, in the seat next to you on the other sideline, um, you know, in the suit next to you to get a position, you know, in the business world, uh, you know, I think you have to be committed. And so I think it really comes down to, you know, having a, having a purpose, attacking it with passion and, you know, working really hard at it. Well, again, thank you, Coach, for your time. This has been great. Uh, hopefully people can pull some knowledge from it, just like I have sitting here with you. So it's been great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Keys, keys, keys. I got the keys.